Well, actually, after, after that, I kind of, I kind of quit the business, and uh, and then I came back. I said, Nah, I'm not a sucker. I'm not a quitter. So I said, I'm going to make a comeback, and I'm going to come back with the biggest group in the history of the business. I'm going to take me five white kids and do what I did with them black kids, and uh, and we're going to blow this thing up. Right now, a lot that's of that's what I did. Right, a lot of people saying that this was out of revenge of what went down with New Edition. Now, what was the true vision of no, New Kids? No, no, no. I, I never, you know, I, I would be lying to you if I said I was not pissed at New Edition. I mean, New Edition, I have talked about that, and um, but uh, I, I don't think I'm not a guy who carries that type of stuff on my shoulder. When I'm into something, I'm, I got my mind on what I'm doing. So no, it was not out of revenge. Okay. Uh, I mean, matter of fact, uh, within that time, me and Michael Bivens got together. We had some meetings, and uh, we said we're going to work very closely together. I, to this day, I probably did two or three albums with uh, that me and Michael Bivens executive produced together. I had several meetings. With, we did the Tom Joyner show together. Tom Joyner thought that these guys hated me. I said, Tom, I came here with him. So no, today they're probably my closest friends in the entertainment business. Mm-hmm. So uh, no, it's nothing like what people think. People think the direct opposite. Mm-hmm. So it was just basically blown way out of proportion. It it was, and even with the TV show, uh, New Edition asked me to be a part of it. Otherwise, I'd have never been on the show. They say they ask us who was special to us and what friends. I say, Michael, I'll do this show only on one condition: if you all finally clear up. All of that craziness about me taking the money. He says, okay, we'll do that. But they didn't do it. Okay. They did, it, it still was left unsolved. But if you, if you notice, Michael Bivens did say one thing. He did say it, and we don't know who took the money. Because that, that means somebody asked him, did Maurice Starr take your money? But you just didn't see that part. But if you notice, if you look at that film, Michael Bivens says, we don't know who took our money. Well, and there's a reason why he said that. Like I say, it was bad guys who really took it. And I don't blame them for saying that. I probably would say it, too. And they're not trying to get in any more lawsuits. Because right. they know I, I'm not going to sue them because they're my friends. So they know I'm fine. They're not worried about me. Who they're worried about is some guys who really did take it. They think they'll sue their pants off. Right. Now, tell me about Mary Alpha. She was the main person helping you during the New Kids auditions. Absolutely. Very good friend. Mary Alpha at this time is um, is not doing well. She has terminal cancer. Mm-hmm. And um very good friend of mine. Yeah, she's a hard worker, young white lady, and uh, she's just a really good person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sad, sad to hear. We definitely keep her and her family in our prayers here on the time machine. Right. Now, um, Donnie was the first new kid to get picked, right? Donnie was the first person, but he wasn't the first new kid. First new kid was Mark Wahlberg. Okay. Marky Mark, kids. Marky Mark. That oh. was the first kid. Donnie said, I got a brother because I was trying to put the group together. I said, we need younger kids. I said, you know any kid about 11 or 12 years old? He said, well, my little brother's 11 or 12. I said, well, let's go meet him. I woke him up in the bed. I said, kid, how would you like to be a star? I said, what's his name again? He said, Mark Wahlberg. I said, okay. Of course, he's the big star now that was up for an Oscar recently. Yeah, and I just saw Donnie on. Uh, he has his own new TV show. So, yeah, I got them all started. Okay. Now, who was next to come after Donnie? Was it Jordan? Uh, wow, now you're going back on me. I really don't remember who who came, when, what, and where. Because I think a lot of them came around the same time. We put a couple of guys out. I remember one kid named Jamie. He was um, he was in, and then his mother was like, nah, we can't take this serious. So she took him out, and uh, the group became famous, and uh, he ended up on the tabloids. Okay. Uh, with some uh, problems. Okay, and then after Jamie left, that's when you went ahead and got Joey McIntyre. That's right, young Joey. Okay, and I believe, you know, he was like the last bunch, so he was like, I think, what, 11 or 12 years old? Yeah, he was about 12. 12? Joey was the last one. He was about 12 years old. Mm-hmm. And the oldest was like 16. John was the oldest, right? Yeah, John was the oldest. He was about 16 years old. So um, tell me about the early years of the new kids, and how did you come up with the name Nine Nook? Well, no, look, I don't know. I was, I got a friend named Arthur Baker. He always come up with crazy names, and and uh, I said, let me come up with something crazy. It might work. 
so I said, and I look, so when I took it to uh, the record company, the guy, uh, what's his name, Larkin Arnold, say, Nine Nook? He said, man, he said, you got a song on here called New Kids on the Block. He said, why don't you call him that? So the next thing I did is got a copyright, I copyrighted the name. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, I said, okay. So I came back and I told the guys, I said, hey, your new name is New Kids on the Block. That's what the record company want to call you. Right. And then was back in 86, the debut album came out. Be My Girl got play up in Boston but disappeared from Radio Airways. And then the first album right. didn't do so well sales-wise. Now, explain that period when the first album didn't go well and you and the late Dick Scott went up to the brass at Columbia to say, okay, we want to do a second album, which came to be Hanging Tough. Well, well Dick Scott was, didn't go up to the label with me. I know a lot of people wrote that Dick Scott did this and he did that. Well, Dick Scott is no longer with us, and unfortunately he can't defend himself. But uh, he defended himself pretty well when he was alive. <laughs> but, uh, uh, no, he wasn't with me. I went up there with the kids. I went to the top brass. Okay. And uh, told them that, you know, this thing can be big. We just need you guys to get behind it. And they pretty much say, well, we're thinking about kicking you off. So I said, okay. <laughs> so, uh but anyway, they got rid of some, they had a shake-up in the label, and some other fellows came in, uh, got a higher position. They kicked out Larkin Arnold, the guy that I knew, the guy who got us up and going. And so Cecil Holmes, they uh, gave him a chance, and he was the guy who got us got us up and going. Okay. Now, where did the inspiration for Please Don't Go Girl come from? Please Don't Go Girl was just a song that I wrote. I always liked the Jackson 5 sound. And I think it came from the song Got To Be There by the Jackson 5. Um, that's where I kind of got that from. Okay, because it was believed that the record in, in the beginning wasn't really picking up, but then a pop station out of Tampa started picking it up, and then it started to grow like wildfire. Yeah. Wow, you do your homework, I tell you. That is correct. A pop say Hot 105. And Tampa picked it up and um, uh, got it going. Actually, they had saw a video on BET that I did on Video Vibrations with Alvin Jones. <laughs> video. And uh, well, with Alvin Jones, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, uh, I called Alvin up and uh, had him. And at the time, the person in charge of all program, Alvin's boss, was a woman that runs Sister Sister now, uh, Jamie Foster Brown. So I asked Jamie and Alvin to come on up to Boston, and that's when, when my relationship with Alvin Jones and Jamie Foster Brown began. And so they said, we like them, we like to play them, and, and uh, they took it back to BET, and they started playing it. So the guy from Tampa Hot 105, he saw it, and, and he couldn't believe it. He thought that black kids, he, he, just, he saw these white kids, but he thought they sounded like black kids. And uh, he took the record to start playing it. It became number one on the station. So he called uh, the radio station, I mean the uh, record company, CBS in New York, told one of the guys, hey, man, I think y'all got a hit on your hands. Right. And the guy at the record label had never heard of New Kids on the Block. He says, who? He said, y'all got an artist named New Kids, called New Kids on the Block that I believe got a number one record. The guy said, the guy in promotion the CBS said, we ain't got no artist called New Kids on the Block. He said, well, I'm sitting here looking at the label to say Columbia Records. And it said, just released. He uh-huh. said, oops, oh, there's my fuel tank. But anyway, um, it, it was just released, and um, uh, it, it was just released, and that's when, um, uh, uh, one second. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. So what, what was the last question? Okay, it was like the record, it was very R&B. Now tell me about the the first version of the Please Don't Go Girl video with Dare in the Snow. Okay, now one more second. All right. All right, sorry about that. Okay. Where were we? All right, the first, vis- the first version of Please Don't Go Girl in the Snow. Tell me about that. The first version of Please Don't Go Girl. The video, the one that was played on BET. The video was uh, done at a friend of mine's house, a uh, good name, Larry Wu. And, uh, of course, I wrote the treatment and was one of the producers. I co-produced it with a producer out of um, L.A. I forget Ken's last name. But um, he did a great job, and he was, I don't know how it came about. He wanted to do it. He says, okay, yeah, I can help you. And uh, we shot it. Uh-huh. And, um, and we got it on BET. 